Chapter 1, Introduction to Group Accounts. Now we're starting off with the financial reporting element of the syllabus and with the topic of group accounts. In this chapter, we're going to look at what is a group of companies, why we prepare group accounts, and how we start to prepare a group statement of financial position. Now say for example I run a business and I'm performing particularly well and I want to grow my business, there are two basic ways in which I can go about doing it. Firstly, I could grow organically, I could recruit more staff, I could open up more offices and so on. Or instead, a quicker way to grow my business would be to acquire shares in another company. And if I acquire a controlling interest in another company, we say that this company is a subsidiary company. So if my company buys enough shares in another company to control it, then we call it a subsidiary. And what we've created is a group of companies. Now, normally we have control over another company if we own more than 50% of the shares in it. However, we'll see right at the end of this chapter that there may be exceptions to this rule and certain situations where we can have control but earn less than 50%. But for the time being, we're going to assume that we control a subsidiary company if we own more than 50% of the shares. So what we've got here is a diagram of a group structure. So we've got three companies here. Company A we call the parent, or sometimes we call company A the holding company, and both of these terms mean exactly the same thing. And then B and C are both subsidiary companies because A owns enough shares to control them. So we own 100% of the shares in B and 75% of the shares in C. And together, these three companies are what we call a group of companies. Now, when A purchases the shares in B and C, the investment in its own financial statements will simply be shown at cost. So we'll credit cash when we spend the money to buy the shares and we'll debit investments, which will be a non-current asset. And then going forwards, A can continue to carry those investments at their original cost. And this basically means that over the course of time, it's impossible for the shareholders in A to see how well the performance of the subsidiaries is going. So it's hard for the shareholders to know or impossible for them to know whether the shares in B and C were a good investment or not. All they can see is this investment at cost, which doesn't change. So therefore, the solution to this problem is when we have a company which controls another, as well as preparing accounts for itself, it also has to produce an additional set of accounts. And we call these the group or the consolidated accounts. So again, two words for exactly the same thing. And the purpose of these accounts is to present the results of the group of companies as though they were a single business entity. So basically what we're doing is we are adding together all of the figures for the companies within the group. So in the case of our little illustration, it will be companies A, B and C. And this additional set of accounts is issued to the shareholders of the parent's company. So in this case, it would be company A. So as well as getting the figures for company A on its own, they will also see the combined assets, liabilities and results of all of the companies within the group. So let's move on now in section two and think about how we go about preparing a set of group accounts. We're going to start off in chapters one and two by looking at the group statement of financial position. And then in chapter three, we'll move on and take a look at the group statement of profit or loss. Now, in its most basic form, to prepare group accounts, we're simply adding together the figures in the statement of financial position of the parent and subsidiaries. And as we'll learn, over the course of the next couple of chapters, we will also need to put through some additional workings. However, we're going to start off with some basic rules that you need to learn. The first rule is that the investment in the subsidiary that we see in the individual company accounts of the parent company never appears in the consolidated set of accounts. 
Because we're preparing these accounts as though the companies within the group are a single business entity, you can't invest in yourself. So therefore, we never show the investments in the subsidiary. What this is actually replaced by are the net assets of the subsidiary, which we're simply going to add together, and something called goodwill, which we will come on to in just a minute or two. The second rule is that the share capital figure that we show in the group accounts is that of the parent company only. So this line, we don't add together all of the companies. We simply take the share capital of the parent company because that is the ultimate owner of the other companies and the accounts are going to the shareholders of the parent company. Then as we've said, the assets and liabilities of the companies within the group are added together. We will have one or two adjustments to these, which we will take a look at in chapter two. We then need to calculate goodwill, which we show as an intangible non-current asset. And then we also need a working to calculate the retained earnings for the group. So let's start off with a fairly simple illustration to show you how we would go about preparing a set of group accounts for two companies, A and B. Now in this situation, A is buying 100% of the shares in B for $1,000 in cash on the 1st of January 2013. What we've got here are the individual company statements of financial position, and then we're basically adding these together to get the consolidated statement of financial position. And this is on the date of acquisition, so the very first day that B is owned by A. So hopefully you can see for our assets, so our property, plant and equipment, we're simply adding the figures together. The same again for our inventories, our trade receivables and our cash, we're adding them all together. The share capital, remember, is the share capital of A only, so just of the parent company. Retained earnings will do a working for, and then current liabilities, again, we're simply just adding together. Now, you can see in A's accounts, we have got the investment at B at cost, because we're told we bought the shares in B for $1,000 in cash. But you can see that in the group accounts, we're ignoring it, so we're not showing a figure for our investment in B. So what we've got now are we have got two lines with some missing figures. We've got to put in a figure for our goodwill and we have also got to put in a number for our retained earnings. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do now. Starting off with goodwill then, we've got a definition of goodwill which is basically the difference between the cost of the business as a whole and the fair value of the identifiable net assets within the business. So basically it's the difference between what we pay for our shares in the subsidiary and what we get in terms of our share of the net assets. Now when a parent company buys shares in a subsidiary, it will normally pay more for that company than what the net assets are stated at on the statement of financial position. And the reason for this is that there's often a certain amount of value within a business that that business is not allowed to show in its accounts. So the sort of things that I'm thinking of are things like um, the reputation of the business or the customer base or perhaps the brand, which have some kind of value, but the company that we're acquiring is not allowed to show them as an asset in their own accounts. So therefore we have this goodwill, so the difference between what we're paying and the net assets on the statement of financial position. We calculate the goodwill at the date of acquisition and it's considered to be an asset of the group. We show it as an intangible non-current asset in the group statement of financial position. Now most intangible assets we will amortise over their useful life which is just like the same as depreciating them. But goodwill, we don't do that. We do what we call an annual impairment review. Impairment basically is just a decrease in value. You don't need to worry about how we would go about doing it. What you will need to know and what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is simply how we account for it. But in the meantime, let's think about how we go about calculating goodwill. Now, we need a few pieces of information. The first piece of information we need is the cost of the investment and that's quite easy in this illustration because it's in the statement of financial position of APLC. You remember we had a cost of $1,000. 
What we also need are the net assets of the subsidiary at the acquisition date. Now there are two ways of calculating net assets. The first way is by taking our total assets minus our total liabilities. So if we go back to companies A and B, the way that we could work out the net assets of B is we can add up our total assets, take away our liabilities, so that's equal to the 1,550 minus, we've only got current liabilities of 650, which gives us 900. So that's one way of working out the net assets of B. Now another way of doing it is rather than taking the assets minus the liabilities, is we can take our share capital plus our retained earnings, which will also give you 900, so 800 plus 100. And this will always work because the statement of financial position balances. Now in an exam, you're not going to be given details of the assets and liabilities of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition. So instead, this is the way that you need to get used to doing it by taking the share capital and retained earnings. It will always give you the same number. And then the final thing that you need is the percentage of ownership, which in the case of A and B is quite easy, it's 100%. So therefore, the way that we calculate our goodwill, you can see here in working one, is we take our cost of combination of 1,000 and then we subtract B's net assets at acquisition date, so our share capital plus our retained earnings and the difference is our goodwill, which is 100. So what we're going to do with that is we're going to pop that into our statement of financial position, so 100 and we got that from our working one. So that just leaves us with our retained earnings that we need to calculate now. Now with our retained earnings, we don't add the companies together. The way that we calculate our group retained earnings is we take the retained earnings of the parent company plus we take the group company's share of the subsidiary's post acquisition reserves, i.e. our share of the subsidiary's profit that has been generated since we acquired the shares. We say that any profits that were generated before the subsidiary became part of the group, it's not fair to put them in our group account because they were earned before we owned our shares in the subsidiary. Now in the case of A and B, it's actually quite straightforward because we're preparing the group financial statement of financial position on the date of acquisition. So therefore there are no post acquisition retained earnings. In any case, I'll show you the working as to how we would calculate our group retained earnings because you'll find it useful a little bit later on. So the way that we go about doing this is we set up a working with a column for each company, so A and B. We always start off with the retained earnings at the statement of financial position date per the question, which we just copy in. We then take away the subsidiary's retained earnings at acquisition because they were generated before B became part of the group. And in the case of this example, it's the only time you'll ever see it, but the retained earnings at the year end or at the reporting date are the same as the retained earnings at acquisition because we're preparing the group statement of financial position on the date of acquisition. So we have nil for B. We're going to take our 100% share of nil. We would then take away any goodwill impairment losses, which we will meet in just a moment, and that will give us group retained earnings in this case of $3,000. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put that $3,000 into our group statement of financial position here as being our retained earnings. And then you can see if we actually add all of this up, we will get a total of $17,000. 850 for the total assets and also 17,850 for the equity and liabilities. So you can see now that our group statement of financial position actually balances.